everybody. This is Chris. And Kathy. We wanted to take a minute to thank you all for tuning in. We appreciate every listener and are grateful for this platform. Please help us share our vision by subscribing to our show through your favorite streaming app. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Petability Podcast. Check out our ever-growing list of affiliates and sponsors. Simply go to the show notes for information and links. Proceeds from purchases help to support our show. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Petability. I'm your host, Kathy Simon, Certified Veterinary Technician and Certified Canine Rehabilitation Practitioner. And I'm your host, Chris Cranston, Licensed Physical Therapist and Small Animal Physical Rehabilitationist. Our podcast provides interviews and information to help your pets live their best lives. Good afternoon, Chris. How are you doing today? Hi, Kathy. Thanks for asking. I'm well. I'm well. What's going on with you? Good, good, good. Hey, listen, we've got a great show today and a great topic. But before we do that, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about our friends at Medco Vet. You want to hear what I have to say? Yes, they're our new sponsor. Do tell. I know. Yes. My dog, Mac, was sick over the holiday weekend, Chris. Oh, no. I know. It was really sad. Nothing is sadder than a pug that doesn't feel good. It's just so sad. He was just lethargic and quiet, and he slept through his lunch, which is like a big, big deal. Mm. You know, he just wasn't engaging in some of the, you know, a lot of the stuff that he likes to do. And you know that like Mac has a routine and he likes to do things on time, right? So those are the first clues that he wasn't feeling well. And so uh, thankfully our vet was able to squeeze us in on that Friday before July 4th weekend. And then um, he had some blood work and x-rays. And what we saw on x-ray is that Mac was having an episode of allergic bronchitis. And uh, Mac does have a lot of environmental allergies. So grass and trees and pollen and dust. And so Dr. McMillan had prescribed him a medication to help him with that. And when I got home, I kept thinking to myself, I'm like, bronchitis, bronchitis. And I remember you saying, anything with an itis is inflammation. That's the Medco vet luma. And right. I used it. I, yeah. And I used it. It was so easy and so simple. I would just use it while he was sleeping over the chest area and then roll him over and do the other side. And he felt better probably in, I want to say 36 to 48 hours, he was feeling better. And we had also had medication, but I think that Medco Vet Luma is kind of what pushed just to the finish line faster uh, right. with this episode of allergic bronchitis. So thank you, Medco Vet Luma. This is why we have chose to partner with them because this is a great product. And I think that this was, this was really helpful in a time of crisis for me and my dog. Right. And empowered you, as we always say, and, you know, it's an investment, right? But right. then when these things arise that you n never can predict. You have it at your disposal, you know, certainly renting it for a neurological problem or an orthopedic issue, but then, you know, kidney disease in your cat, or like you said, allergic bronchitis in your pug, you right. have it there ready to use. That is so awesome. Right. And I'm glad right. you thought of that as an out of the box, you know, type of condition that might benefit from light therapy. So yeah. way to yeah. go, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you. And um, for those who are worried, Mac is completely 100% back to himself. He is being a little stinker. <laughs> and so and my boy. that's right. And he's not slept through any meals. So he's feeling 100% back. So, thank <laughs> you. So anyway, today, Chris, I think that this was something I had approached you on not that long ago about talking about anti-knuckling products. And we were both like, yeah, I think that's a great, you know, it's a great topic because it can be kind of confusing to wade through those. Right. And I bet for a lot of our owners, they're like, what anti-knuckling? What the heck is that? Right. So we're going to tell you. So the term knuckling is used to describe a dog that that stands on the top of their foot, which we would kind of, we would call knuckles, right? Mm -hmm. On the ground. So they stand on the top of that foot. Yeah. Again, just to create that vision. I mean, it'd be like, you know, create, you make a fist, right? And, and then you're you know, walking on, on all fours or whatever, and you're, you're on the fist of your hand on those knuckles, as opposed to, you know, normally when a human would crawl, they'd be on the palm of their hand. And so, you know, it's abnormal. It's not a normal gait. And we're going to get into, you know, what conditions will benefit, um, you know, who knuckles and how do these anti-knuckling devices help? So again, it's, it's a device, for lack of a better word, a tool to put the foot 
in a proper position during ambulation exercise so that it is put in that normal proper position again. And so dogs that might knuckle would be patients that have things like some kind of neurological condition like intervertebral disc disease or nerve damage or strokes. But there's a whole host of other problems that could cause knuckling as well. Orthopedic issues, sometimes weakness, you know, from our geriatric patients, sometimes those dogs will also knuckle as well. Right. Or, you know, when it's that vicious cycle, we always talk about, you know, and again, it happens typically with aging, but when you have severe osteoarthritis or degenerative joint disease in the hips, knees, then that pain from that severe debilitating arthritis makes a pet not want to move so much because it hurts when they're up and around. And so they become more sedentary, can be very insidious. You know, you may not recognize it as an owner when they're more sedentary, gain weight, but they also lose muscle mass and strength and endurance. And before you know it, they've gotten weaker and it can progress to the point where you start to hear, you know, maybe some, some scuffing of the nails and it could progress to you know, where again, they're literally dragging and blooding those knuckles. The toenail yeah. wear is a big yeah. indication. Like if you see that those toenails are worn down, particularly those two middle toes, yeah, that dog may very well be dragging or or potentially knuckling. Right. And then in that phase, you know, they're probably not a candidate for a device, but it's like you said, Kathy, one of the earliest clues, you know, we always say, check your dog's feet, check their your dog's nails for abnormal wear. And the reason you said those middle two toes is those are the weight bearing toes and they're the longest, right? So they're going to be the ones that are likely going to hit the ground first, but you can get on top of it maybe early and start doing some exercises or, you know, adding, you know, maybe an anti-inflammatory medication or using the Luma from that mm, pet to right. address some of these issues and curtail the progression of the, um, hind limb weakness, which could then lead to needing an anti-knuckling device. You know, and then, or some of our patients who have progressive neurologic diseases, perhaps in the beginning, they don't need so much assistance, but dogs like patients that have degenerative myelopathy, so they may start out with a simple, like maybe just dragging a little bit, but that will progress to needing some type of anti-knuckling product or maybe even wheelchair or wheelchair and anti-knuckling product. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, there there really are a plethora of conditions, diseases, issues that could benefit from these these devices. And I think a lot of things actually in our field of physical rehabilitation, people may not be privy to or aware of until it happens to them. So one of the missions, you know, in our show is to alert you so that you are well equipped and can help your dog live their best life and prevent some of these things from happening. If it does, you know what to do. You know what to look for. So we're here for you. Right. Dogs are very aware of where their feet are oriented in space. And that's because they have these receptors in their feet that send messages back to the brain via the spinal cord. And this information will determine the placement of their feet. But some of these diseases, like we talked about, degenerative myelopathy, IBDD, osteoarthritis, it can interrupt that message to the brain. And it makes me think, I always think of this scenario, like you're on a cell phone and you're talking and everything's fine. And then you go into a tunnel and you're like, and it's just not getting through. And that's kind of what it makes me think of. And so dogs, because of some disease process or because of some weakness or osteoarthritis, they're not getting that message. That is an excellent analogy. Yeah. And, and we're in the Boston area, so we have to drive through tunnels quite a bit. Right. You know, you might be in a mountain pass, you might be on a country road and yeah, that, that message just isn't getting through. And, you know, you, you've mis- mentioned IBDD and again, that stands for intervertebral disc disease. And so a lot of these things that we're talking about, even a tumor, you know, it can put pressure or like this disc can rupture and or bulge and put pressure on the spinal cord. I think also thinking about that spinal cord as the hose, right? It's the conduit from the brain to the body. And if there, if you put a kink in that hose, you know, the disc, the tumor, whatever it may be, then 
that message, that water isn't going to get through the hose. So that's another analogy to kind of think about things. And, you know, it, it's part of the condition, but what do we do to help your dog to thrive and to be able to continue with their activities the best they can? And hopefully, if it's an acute condition that does get better, this is a temporary situation, right? And we use this device just for the time that it takes to get better. So Chris, why don't we go into talking about how anti-knuckling devices work? Sure. So would say in general, it is a low profile, lightweight, unobscure device that is put on the foot or toes to keep them in the proper position. This may be a hard shelled orthotic, or it could be elasticized. It could be only on the foot and ankle area or foot and wrist area in case of the, the front limbs. But I'd say, Kathy, don't we see the need for these devices more prevalently in the rear legs than the front legs? It's typically the rear leg. It is. And, it, and it's trickier to find a device for the front limbs and that, that's actually effective just because of the way they're shaped and, and the biomechanics and things. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But, you know, also there are certain devices that will describe that actually go from the rear feet, for example, up to a harness or, you know, you may be able to attach something to the wheelchair if your dog is is in that situation. So yeah, their whole purpose is just to keep that foot in the proper position and enhance the feedback, you know, body to brain, brain to body for neuromuscular re-education. And hopefully it gets better depending on the diagnosis or in some cases, like you described before, could be long-term, could be progressive. And it's something then that the pet will need to use longer term. And knuckling becomes problematic for so many reasons. Mm -hmm. um, it limits the dog's mobility. It's difficult to walk when you're unaware of where your foot placement is. Uh, so we worry about injury, dragging and knuckling cause abrasions on the top of that foot. And, and those can be continually reopened because yeah. they're dragging their foot. Those can um, be really nasty and, like you said, hard right. to heal. And yeah, yeah that's, that's a real problem that could then right. lead to infection and so forth. Exactly. And we had talked about this the other day about whether we think that knuckling is a painful situation for the dog. I'm not sure that knuckling is a painful thing. I think that when you start getting those abrasions and sores and reopening those sores, I think that's painful, but I'm not sure that knuckling itself is painful for a patient. Right. It, it looks awful. And I've had yes. many clients be very, very concerned. Of course, we want to prevent it as much as possible, but if you have a dog with a profound neurological disease that's that's essentially paralyzed in the hind limbs, mm -hmm. they're going to knuckle. And and potentially you're even, you know, using a harness with them and and they're dragging and you have to lift higher. And so there, you know, is the potential for some abrasion in which you need some protection. But don't be overly concerned about it. The dog just wants to get from point A to point B and and have your love and and so forth. Yeah, if you think about our friend Hugo, Hugo is living the life. And um, I don't think that he's particularly concerned with, you know where his feet are knuckling, you know, I think he's just really more concerned about being with his mom and having a good time. And so speaking just makes of having a good time, you know, Hugo yeah. and his mom and I went to a dance recently and he was the, the life of the party. So <laughs> I saw the video footage. <laughs> yeah. Hugo, Hugo has a fan club. And uh, for those of you who have, haven't heard, we did interview Phoebe, his owner, and Hugo does have degenerative myelopathy. So he definitely has gone through a gazillion types of booties and anti-knuckling devices in his right. journey of almost two years at this point. And I wonder if people are thinking about anti about knuckling in dogs that are, you know, large breed. And maybe that's just because, you know, you see dogs of more things like degenerative myelopathies, oftentimes in like your German Shepherds or your uh, Chesapeake Bay Retrievers. But knuckling can happen to any size dog or a of any breed or size. Yeah. So it's not just our large dogs. It can happen to our smaller dogs too. Exactly. And I, I had a little uh, young cat. I think it was about 10 months old. It was a rescue. Owners went down from the Boston area to New York to get this cat, you know, and seen something online about it. 
and it had definitely had nerve damage. Mm -hmm. And we configured an anti-knuckling device for that cat. Of course, it had to be supervised at all times, and the cat was very crafty <laughs> at getting it off. But in the end, this cat fully recovered. I went to their house. Nice. This is years ago because she's like, you've just got to come over and see, you know, how, mm -hmm. how well he's doing. And oh my gosh, I mean, springing off the walls, on and off furniture. So again, that was a very gratifying case in which we temporarily use something to help the cat to recover more swiftly. You did gait training with him. Yeah. Gait yeah. training, wound prevention, which is the two, two of the, two of the best things that happens with anti-knuckling devices gate retraining and wound prevention. Right. And imagine a cat with wounds. I mean, even a dog too. I mean, they want to lick, yeah. lick, lick, and then it goes into a chronic problem and so on and so forth. So, so okay. let's get into some of the, the products that are out there. You know, Kathy, I remember, you know, we both started in the very early stages. So, you know, Kathy was in the, the first class, one of the first 36 to, to graduate from the very first certification program in the world through the University of Tennessee and get her CCRP. And I was in the third class, but back then we didn't have really any products. You know, it was like we were making it up as, as we go. And, you know, I remember kind of scrambling and trying to, you know, configure something that could help a dog to, to not knuckle because I knew it just needed that, right? Yeah. And uh, would be beneficial. And, you know, so, you know, using TheraBand, um, which are the elastic bands that people exercise with, and there's TheraTubing, and for little animals, even using, you know, rubber bands and things, but trying to figure something out. And now there are so many products out there that can be tried and, you know, different Pros and cons, I guess, for each one and and definitely knowing the condition that you're trying to treat and the goal uh, of that treatment, you know, and is it going to be a long-term thing or is it just a short-term thing? One of my favorite anti-knuckling devices is the toe up from our friends at OrthoPets. I think this is a great tool for preventing knuckling. It comes with the boot and an ankle cuff and the ankle cuff and the boot are connected with a cord and you can put tension on that cord depending on what how much your dog needs to bring that foot forward. And it's just, it's very durable as well. So that's one of my favorite products. And I think maybe when we do our, our show notes, we'll put in some links so people can take a look at some of these products as well. Yeah. And I think that's the goal of all of these products. I think the first one I used was the Dorsiflex Assist from Therapaw. And mm -hmm. our friend Eladia Borghese has expanded. So a lot of you started out with a company called Therapaw, and now it has expanded to include VitalVet. And VitalVet is a comprehensive online platform that's on a mission to eradicate the words. These are a lot of these words, if I had only known from our vocabularies. Uh, when we interviewed her back in February of 2022, offered over 500 products. And I'm sure that list has grown since then. But I was looking at some of those today. And again, the Therapod Dorsiflex Assist, this is one of the companies that has both a front limb and rear limb option to help. Um, and I've used both, definitely. I had a little, um, oh, ZD, the little Maltese that was, oh, attacked, yeah. By, yeah, yeah. That was attacked by the coyote and uh, bitten in the neck and it affected her spinal cord. And so she um, didn't have full use of one of her front legs and we got this little <laughs> the pod, dorsiflex assist for her, her front leg. It was so cute. And Kathy, I could pass on those pictures and videos and people can Beauty see that in our so social cute. media. You know, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, Vital Vet because this is a great platform for owners. If I wanted to research anti-knuckling devices, it's all there on Vital Vet. Mm -hmm. I can go to Vital Vet, put in the search for anti-knuckling devices, and all the ones that are listed there will come up. Yeah. So we can compare, we can compare those products right there on their website. So it's very convenient. Yes. It's made it one-stop shopping and very useful for both uh, practitioners and pet parents. And, you know, that brings to mind too, some of these products can be purchased over the counter, if you will, off the shelf, you know, with sizing such as, you know, extra small, small, medium, large, extra large, but some can also be made in a custom fashion um, for which they are prescribed. So sometimes you have to go through your veterinarian, but a lot of these you can just find, search online and uh, get what you think would be best for your dog. Right. And the importance of that with some of these products and your veterinarian is we need to know 
Do you need a heavy boot? Do you need a light boot? Do you, what kind of fabric? Do you need stays on that, on the sides of that boot? Um, so it's important with some of these more complex products to involve your veterinarian because there's a lot of stuff we need to know about your dog's mobility and, and pain level and, and what they need to accommodate them. Yeah, and some of them over the counter, some of them more complex. Yeah. And I was just going to piggyback, Kathy, on that too, because we haven't mentioned some congenital issues and mm-hmm. deformities. And mm-hmm. that would definitely be a place where you'd want a custom product because maybe, you know, the, the foot isn't normal. I, I remember I had a, a Sheltie Bo who it was speculative as to what happened, but essentially he was missing part of his foot. And mm-hmm. it would get, it was a rear foot and it would get abraded and was uncomfortable for him to walk on and, and so forth. And I was uh, working actually with a dermatologist um, to protect his skin and invested in a custom uh, boot for him. Um, yeah, there's just all kinds of situations. And earlier I mentioned, you know, there's elastic products and as you described, you know, kind of adding tension and, and pulling the toes up. And then there can be rigid products that are Velcroed on from underneath the foot and keep it in, in a proper place. But one of the newer products out there is skates. Have you used the skates? I have not used the skates. I have seen them though on a patient who another therapist was seeing who's a great Pyrenees and he's in a wheelchair. And you know what? It kept his feet from getting abraded. It was, a, I've not used them, but on that dog, it was very effective. He was at the end stage, I think, of DM. And so these skates just kept him from, kept his feet moving and no abrasions. So it was neat to see. Right. So literally they're little wheeled booties that you put on their feet and use primarily, as you mentioned, for dogs in wheelchairs or mobility carts. And I also, I've not used them personally, but I interfaced with a pet owner who used it for her young dog who had essentially been parapretic uh, since she got her, rescued her as, as a puppy. And she was a large breed and she was growing and full of energy. So it was hard for people to keep up with her. She said when she used the skates in her wheelchair, it made all the difference in the world. And she actually got better through, through using them. So that's, that's also an option. Well, you know, and it brings up a point that about strength in these dogs that need anti-knuckling devices, because a fair amount of them will require the dog to have some ability to flex the knee and the hip to bring the foot forward. Uh, So some dogs may qualify for one particular type of boot and some dogs may not. And so dogs maybe at the end stage of DM might do better with the boots with the skates versus maybe the toe up or the dorsiflex. And I also think that uh, for dogs in that situation who don't have the strength to to pull that leg forward, you know, using, it's hard to describe again, but using one of the devices where the elastic actually goes from the ankle foot toe area to a harness that's forward. So as they're moving along and tension is increased, by them moving forward, then it will bring that leg forward in a swing and help to place it properly on the ground. So I know Biko was one of the first companies to come out with that. That's B-I-K-O, and that's also on the Vital Vet site. But then there's a new company that I think is a little bit better. They improved on the Biko. It's called the Canine Mobility Anti-Knuckling Device. And the the reason that it's different is instead of just having a band that goes to the ankle area, it has an extra strap that goes through the toes and keeps those toes up. So it not only advances the leg, but it picks up those toes. So it's a win-win. Yeah. And with the, I actually like those devices too. I usually tell people to make sure you check if you're going to use a device like that with the cord that goes between the toes, just be sure you check the toes periodically on the dog and make sure that there's no you know, rubbing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it would only be used while they're in the wheelchair, which again, they're not going to be in the wheelchair, hopefully, you know, 24-7, right? It's a, <laughs> it's just used, you know, maybe for a few hours at most at a time. But that is one of the things I think we should discuss, like, you know, some of the precautions or downsides of using something like this. So, you know, I think you mentioned like the weight of the boot, so that has to be appropriate. I also think the material needs to be such that it's breathable. If these boots get wet and, you know, they're not taken off, then it can cause like a cellulitis or something like that. So having a breathable uh, boot 
one of the things I struggle with as a rehab practitioner is if I'm going to put a boot on a dog, am I going to be interrupting or losing any of those proprioceptive signals or feedback to the brain by adding that boot on? It, but sometimes I think you, I think sometimes having the boot outweighs that, that outweighs it because I don't want your dog to get abrasions or infections or sore toes. And if you think about the posture of changing the, your, your whole posture, standing on top of your knuckles, we've talked about this before, uh, about how just changing posture, like with long toenails, I get to rock back, you know, and, and then that causes compensatory related issues. So sometimes they worry if I put a boot on, am I going to be losing proprioceptive signals? Are they going to lose that feedback from the ground? But sometimes I think the wearing of the boot just sort of out that outweighs it by protecting the foot. And maybe, you know, maybe you do a little bit of both. Maybe you put it on and you take it off and you put it on and take it off. But the downside, I think, yeah, with some covering the foot is maybe you're losing some signals from the ground. Well, and I agree too, you know, as we just implied that these devices, they're really not doing any good unless they're used during exercise or when they're up and, and walking and ambulating. You know, they certainly don't need to have them on unless it's like a passive stretching effect or something like that when when they're lying down. So, you know, as you said, when you're taking them on and off, you know, you want to check for any, you know, sorts of wounds or chafing. But again, there's various quality products. And I'm going to plug Therapa again because I know that they have, I think she calls it like reverse seams or something. So there's no seams on the inside of any of their boots or dorsiflex assists so that you're not going to get, you know, rubbing from, from that. We all know if we have a rub in our shoe, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a bunch in your sock or something like that, how irritating yeah. that can be. Yeah. And you get a blister and you, you know, it, it may open and yeah, that's, that's, we don't want remember, to. Remember, yeah. Remember what happened to me last week when I switched my sneakers? Yes. With my, oh, and I had to call you. I was in so much pain. Mm -hmm. um, so just having that change, you know, in that posture was significant. It caused me a lot of pain. Thankfully, I have Chris to reach out to. <laughs> Thankfully. Anytime, Kathy, anytime. Yeah. Thank you. And then, of course, you know, we talked about this already, but the limb strength will matter in the dog and which product that you buy. And that's why it's great to look at the Vital Vet products like right there. We can compare them right there. Right. And of course, yeah. the size, the fitting that needs to be proper too. You can't have a boot that's too big. It won't be effective. And if you have a boot that's too small, it's going to be very tight. It's not going to feel good. <laughs> well, and tight also when you're putting it on. So it's a little bit tricky sometimes, right? Yeah. Most of these are affixed by Velcro. And in order to keep them on the foot, especially for a dog that's really dragging, you know, that friction with the ground or what have you could, you know, pull it off. Now, the advantage is these are toe-up devices, so you're not going to have that type of friction, but you have to have it snug enough that it's going to stay on and not twist on the foot, which is also an issue, much more of an issue with the front limb mm -hmm. and the front legs being straighter you know if you look at a dog that the hind legs you know are, are bent at each of the joints whereas the the front legs are basically you know more up and down so it makes it again trickier to to keep it on that front leg but you have to be careful that it's not too tight like when you pull that velcro around to restrict blood flow which could right. cause swelling and again if it's on for a long time that could you know cause damage right tissue damage mm -hmm. Yes, so yeah. there's always things to consider. I mean, some of these things seem like a no brainer, but we try to point out things that may not be so obvious. And again, we've always say, we always say that each patient, regardless of their disease process is an individual. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to look at everything in that, that patient. We need to look at all, of, all the factors, the disease, the size, their limb strength, you know, range and of motion. Their, range of motion, their tolerance, right? Their tolerance for wearing the boots. So all right. those things have to be taken into consideration. So two dogs that have the same disease, maybe two different individuals, two different personalities, right? Two different exactly. uh, bodies, you know. <laughs> and and some dogs, you know, are really wigged out by somebody messing with their feet. And, you know, so again, depending on the condition, they could also be very sensitized. So mm -hmm. if there's a nerve issue going on, it could make just, you know, the slightest touch. And if you're having to finagle the foot to get it into this, this boot that you know will ultimately be helpful, you know, that's, that's probably not such a good thing. So maybe another product that opens widely or they simply can lie their paw in and there's minimal, you know, contact. There's just all kinds of things. The shape of the foot, it's like you got to go wide first and then skinny 
so it does take a little bit of maneuvering to get the foot into a boot. It's not always that easy. You know? Right, right. I just want to kind of go back to the range of motion thing. Mm-hmm. Um, because again, as rehabbers, you know, you'd already mentioned it, but there can be loss of motion at the joints due to, for example, arthritis, but also these neurological conditions. So if there's high tone, like sometimes people say, my my dog's leg is really tight. And it's not necessarily that the muscles are tight. It's that there's an abnormal signal going from the brain to those muscles that are causing them to contract all the time, basically creating tone. So it's neurological tone that holds the limb in a stiff position. That needs to be addressed. Again, these devices are going to be most effective if they have some strength in their hip girdle, but they also need that range of motion, that ability to bend those joints of the limb because you want to be able to to bring those toes up so that they can be placed properly on the ground. I just want to say this too, because I've seen dogs that in the later stages, the muscles have pulled those toes under into a knuckled position and they are so tight because there's an imbalance there. So the muscles that flex the toes are stronger than the muscles that lift the toes. And so certainly before using these devices, you have to stretch gradually, stretch out those muscles and wear these devices for a shorter period of time until the body has responded in a way that those that foot can get flat on the ground. Hey, and that's where your rehab tech is going to, or your rehab practitioner is going to come in because they can help you determine h- how to acclimate the dog to a toe up or a dorsiflex. You know, you're right. You don't want to just get this, get a product and then slap it on, you know, and then 24 seven, your dog's in this, in this boot. This is where you're somebody who knows uh, rehabilitation, anatomy, physiology is really going to be able to help you acclimate the dog to the boot and there and lots of dogs will acclimate to the boot because I know there are probably people out there going, oh my dog would never wear a boot. But if you do it in a positive manner, if we do it in a respectful, positive manner, yeah, I think that that a lot of dogs can acclimate to wearing the boot. And and I do remember our friend Martin Kaufman at Orthopet saying that once the pet realizes, hey, I can move better, this feels good that process goes more seamlessly. So again, just making sure that it's the right size, the right fit, the right product for your dog. And hopefully this podcast gives you some fodder for for thinking about that and those considerations. Yeah, you're right. And sometimes dogs, especially like if I, I, that makes me think of wheelchairs because, you know, I think oftentimes I have clients tell me they don't think their dog would do a wheelchair, use a wheelchair. But oftentimes the first time I get them in it, maybe they back up a little bit, maybe they're a little concerned, but once they've gone forward, and realize that they can move and they have freedom and they're independent of us carrying them or lifting them. Usually it's a very good experience. Exactly. So don't be a naysayer. Give it a try. (laughs) And to that point, Kathy, you know, I said like back in the beginning, you know, I tried making some of these devices. I still do that because I know it's a big leap for owners to consider buying something that may be, you know, a couple hundred dollars because it's custom and it's padded and, you know, and so on and so forth. I want to demonstrate proof of concept. I want to show that pet parent how well this is going to work and how it's going to help their dog. So again, a little dog, I'll take some of the larger rubber bands and link them together, you know, to the proper length and put it between their toes and affix it to, you know, a harness or something like that. And they're like, oh my gosh, or the bigger dog, I'll use the TheraBand and I'll put it between their toes. Now, again, temporary, only during PT exercise or to demonstrate to the owner that, yes, if you get the proper product. Versus just using this TheraBand, just think how much better it's going to be. You're seeing it work. And uh, sometimes that's all it takes. And then they're like, I'm in, let's do this. (laughs) Yeah. And you know what? There's a product that I actually will do that in in the underwater treadmill with dogs that need a little bit of assistance in the treadmill is use, you know, either a TheraBand between the the weight bearing toes on the back and then sort of lift as they're going through their swing phase. And there's a product I like to use, Chris, in the underwater treadmill. And that way I don't have to bend over because, you know, I'm old and I can't, (laughs) I can't continue to help them with their swing phase, but the no knuckling hind paw sock is great for using in the underwater treadmill. It's, mm. it's, it's, it really, really does provide the dog with some assistance. And for the therapist, I don't have to bend over a, a, right. and lean over, you know? So I think that's also a product you can check out on Vital Vet. 
Well, and it stays on because I know, like you said, I, I'm in there and sometimes I use TheraBand because I don't want to have to push the, the dog's legs forward in the, in the underwater treadmill and, and assist them with that walking. So I will try to put some TheraBand or something on their toes. And when you're in the water environment, it doesn't stay on so great. Or even on the land up. treadmill. Yeah. Yeah. Floats the, the water, underwater treadmill. It floats up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we talked about nerve damage too. And, you know, specifically like the sciatic nerve can be very problematic. Um, dogs that are hit by a car, maybe fracture their pelvis and it can cause damage to that sciatic nerve that's coming from the low back through the pelvis and hip. So that's a fairly common injury for which these devices can be helpful. And then the radial nerve and some of the brachial plexus injuries in the front, certainly. So we've talked a lot about disease processes, but not specific uh, nerve damage. So I want to mention that. Kathy, do you have any physical rehabilitation exercises that you perform with pets that have this kind of nerve damage, the same pets that would benefit from the anti-knuckling device? The first thing that I think of, Chris, about using the anti-knuckling device and exercises is um, using it with the wheelchair, my patients in the wheelchair, you know, giving them that little extra assistance. And again, you could be in a wheelchair for many reasons, degenerative myelopathy, spinal cord injury, nerve injury. I also like to do just a little bit of like maybe a little downward compression so the dogs are in the boots and just do a little bit of bouncing of the pelvis. So just get those feet to feel the ground and compress through the hind end. All right. All those joints get compressions. They get that feedback. It milks that synovial fluid, which is the lubricant in the joints. And again, that feedback is just so important in terms of feeling the ground. And going back to the wheelchair thing too, you know, the limbs are draggy. You basically have two options. You either put the limbs up in stirrups or on a bar or something like that. So they're suspended off the ground so they don't get abraded and, and damaged or run over even by the wheels of the, the cart. Or you, you know, put them in, in booties and, and their limbs are just hanging down and there, there's friction, there's dragging, and it can affect and make it much harder for them to pull with those front limbs in a mobility cart. And it changes like the whole position of, of the spine and, and everything with those limbs just dragging behind. But if they're in a device like, like the anti-knuckling device and can bring their feet forward in a proper position, then those biomechanics are normalized. You know, again, it can help for neuromuscular reeducation if it's a disc that you know, maybe they've had surgery and the potential is that they're going to get better after surgery on that disc then that would be a, a perfect example and how mm -hmm. to re reteach them their gait, if you will. And how happy are these dogs when they find out they can sort of move on their own, you know, <laughs> they can, mm -hmm. they can do things independently or, or, or with maybe less assistance, you know, or minimal assistance because they've got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There are things to do. And, yeah. and I want to mention a couple other things, you know, sometimes I'll just tap like on the, the shin, of the dog on the outside, just next to the shin bone there. And that tapping is a facilitatory technique to kind of wake up those muscles that can help to pull the ankle and toes up because that's where they reside. That's where they emanate from. So tapping is always excitatory. And then the other thing that I will do is use the, and, and pet owners probably don't know about this, but for you in the vet community out there, using the withdrawal reflex. So what that is, is you're, you're pinching the, the toes or the webbing between the toes. And there's a reflex. Um, it's a protective reflex, right? So if something hurts, it's getting pinched, then the body automatically going through the spinal cord just pulls that foot up and to, to protect it from, from harm. So we're using that very primitive reflex, especially if they are in a wheelchair or maybe standing over a bolster or something like that. We can pinch those toes and it'll cause the limb to flex and place that foot down. So I'll pinch and then, it, you know, it will flex up and go back down. And you do that, you know, just to the point shy of fatigue using that, uh, that pinch reflex. And it, that's a very effective neuromuscular exercise as well. So it's so effective. That. It is really, that's so effective. And I like your tapping of the shin. Sometimes I'll do a little, a little vibration massage from the hip all the way down, down the femur, down the knee into the front of the shin. Oh yeah. Vibration is, is more excitatory than, um, for example, steady pressure, you know, right. that pressure causes relaxation and inhibits 
muscle firing and so forth. And we're trying to do everything to wake that up again for that feedback, brain to body, body to brain. So important. Yes. All right, Chris, I think I, I don't, I think I'm out I of, got nothing. I got nothing. I'm out of stuff to say, <laughs> but I mean, I, I guess the thing I would like to say is whatever, whatever product you or you and your veterinarian decide to use with your dog, it should always be supervised. So while wearing any type of, of boot or anti-knuckling product, somebody should be, somebody needs to watch your dog. Make sure they don't pull it off. They don't chew it. They don't destroy it. They don't swallow it. They don't eat it. I had a dog with an anti-knuckling boot and the other dog pulled it off, right? Mm. So they need to be, they, they need to be supervised uh, with these products and they need to be acclimated. So uh, just so whatever you try, uh, just make sure that you supervise and that you acclimate the dog appropriately. You may not get it right the first time. And so I remember like with Laura Gendron and when we interviewed her on muzzle positivity, she said, don't be afraid to try different muzzles, you know, for your pet, you know, each product has pros and cons. And so if it's not getting the results that, that you thought it would, um, I know it's an investment, but, you know, research and be prepared to maybe try another one. That's okay because we want the best for our pets. Sometimes uh, boots and things like anti-knuckling products and uh, orthotics and stuff like that, or a trial and error mm -hmm. with dogs, given the shape of their foot and the size of the dog and their medical condition. So sometimes, yeah, it's a trial and error sometimes. So don't get discouraged. Don't don't be discouraged. And I will put the links to vitalvet.org and uh, the site itself, because they have so many products and, and things that may be a benefit to you. So I'll put that again, but I'll also put a direct link to the anti-knuckling page. So you can see the, I think there's about 10 or 12 different devices right there for you to check out. All right. Great talk, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> Always a pleasure, Kathy. All right. Thanks. All right. Bye. See ya. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our show. Follow us on social media at Petability Podcast. And please check out our affiliates and sponsors. Simply go to the show notes for information and links. Thank you and tune in next time.